Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. I'm Tom Fresh, your host, and for the next hour, we'll continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Global Vatican, by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. You can get this book from Roman and Littlefield, and I highly encourage you to do it. Read this book from a Protestant understanding. I intend to use this program to help your Protestant understanding so that you can read this book and know what it says, what it really says, and know what it doesn't say. The former ambassador to the, U, to the uh, Holy See, Francis Rooney, knows that the relationship between the beast, that is the papacy, and the image of the beast, the United States government, is essential. For there to be a new world order, and for it to parallel or be the very spitten image of the old world order, the United States has to help. And it does help. And the communication lines between Washington, D.C. and the Vatican must be open and continually occupied. His position as ambassador to the Holy See was not just a formality. It, too, is was an act of United States diplomacy with the Vatican, getting deeper and deeper and deeper in bed with the Vatican. Now, yesterday, we concluded with the first half of page 15 in the prologue of the book. I'll retreat for one, for, uh, one paragraph, and we'll continue where we left off yesterday. Speaking of the... Uh, the necessary relationship between the United States government and the Vatican. Rooney says, I earnestly hope that this book shows the error of those views. That is, well, let me just proceed uh, back up another paragraph. It says, some Americans still question our diplomatic relations with the Holy See. They do so by either citing the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, that it is unconstitutional for the United States government to accord diplomatic status to a religious body, or assuming that, as a matter of real politic, the relationship is inconsequential. I earnestly hope that this book shows the error of those views, says Rooney. President Reagan established full diplomatic relations with the Holy See in 1984 because, among other reasons, he realized that he could have no better partner than Pope John Paul II in the fight against communism. And he was right, according to Rooney. The real reason Ronald Reagan opened formal diplomatic relations with the Vatican is because Vatican Council II had thoroughly done its job in destroying the protest, destroying Protestantism. And Ronald Reagan was born from Irish Roman Catholic stock. And after his presidency, he made a trip to Ireland and acknowledged his Irish Roman Catholic background. And I assert that Ronald Reagan was Catholic all his life, despite his profession of Protestantism and his reestablishment of formal diplomatic relations with the Antichrist of the Bible was a Roman Catholic president literally doing his job to help the papacy get control of our government. Under the guise of, well, overthrowing the Soviet Union, America became immensely more Catholic than it had ever been before. Ronald Reagan's entire White House staff were Roman Catholic. His speechwriter was Roman Catholic you couldn't walk into the Vatican without stepping on the toes of some Roman Catholic serving the pap- serving the American papacy, Ronald Reagan. And we will pay the consequences. We are paying the consequences of one of the most 
deceitful presidents in American history. Despite your personal uh, be, uh, uh, liking of Ronald Reagan, if you understand what motivated the man, you've got to admit he was not honest with the American people. Now, he continues, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Holy See has continued to play an important role as a diplomatic force while maintaining formal relations with 179 countries, a number surpassed only by the United States. So what can we conclude from this, this statement in the opening, in this next paragraph? That the United States of America and the, and the Holy See are the two leading foreign diplomatic states in the world. And why wouldn't they be? They're working together to establish a papal new world order. And foreign diplomacy is just one of the means by which that is achieved. He says, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Holy See has continued to play an important role as a diplomatic force while maintaining formal relations with 179 countries a number surpassed only by the United States. So the Vatican has legal entanglements with 179 countries, and the United States has legal entanglements with more than 179 countries. And the United States serves the papacy. The image of the beast causes the whole world to bow down and worship the first beast. Now, the church, according to Rooney, the church is one of the leading advocates and providers for the poor in the world. That's right. Great is the effort of the Roman Catholic Church to paint itself as a charitable organization. And, oh, the sins that are covered up by charity. The church is one of the leading advocates and providers for the poor in the world, fights against the scourge of human trafficking, and I will tell you that the trafficking of underage children is done primarily by the Roman Catholic Church, and those groups that al- allied with the Roman Catholic Church, like Freemasonry, they are the ones who traffic the children to supply fresh meat for the Roman priests. And advances the cause of human dignity... Uh, What human dignity is there in bowing down and worshiping images and idols? What human dignity is there for anyone who bows down and worships a pedophile pope, much less a Jesuit pedophile pope? Yes, advances the Roman Catholic Church, according to Rooney, advances the cause of human dignity and human rights. Oh, let's speak of human rights. If you're not Roman Catholic, according to Roman Catholic canon law, you can be killed. That's right. It's no sin to kill a Protestant. As a matter of fact, in the Third and Fourth Vatican, uh, Third and Fourth Vatican Councils, uh, ecumenical councils. It was determined that it's not a sin, it's not murder to kill a Protestant, nor to take his property, nor to Catholicize his children after he's gone. It's not only not a sin, it's a meritorious work to serve the Roman Catholic Church by killing heretics. That's established in Roman Catholic canon law. That's still the law of the Roman Catholic Church. According to history, true history, human rights dictates that a man ought to be able to read God's Word and rely upon Scripture to interpret Scripture and to respond to the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit. But the Roman Catholic Church forbid the Scriptures to be written in any language but Latin. 
a dead language only understood by the priests and hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And anybody caught translating the scriptures from Latin into the languages of the, of the people so that they could read it for themselves was worthy of a death sentence. And Rome, to enforce that prohibition for the people to read the Bible, they simply went about, collected all the Bibles, and burned them with the threat that if you don't turn in your Bibles, you will be labeled a heretic and thrown into the Inquisition and tortured. So they burnt Bibles all over Europe. And when that didn't stop the spread of the Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, they began to burn those who read those Bibles. But the Roman Catholic Church passes it off to the world as the protector of human rights. And the world believes it because they don't protest Antichrist anymore. They advance the cause of human dignity and human rights more than any other organization in the world, says Rooney. The Holy See also plays a significant role in pursuing diplomatic solutions to international problems, whether promoting peace between Israel and Palestine. Do you see any peace in Israel and Palestine? I see, according to Roman Catholicism, two heretic nations pitted against one another in perpetual war. <clears throat> The Roman Catholic Church, particularly the papacy, stands aloof and condemns both for their war-making efforts, while beneath the surface, the Jesuits and all the other secret societies that serve the Roman Catholic Church, the militia for the Pope, are inciting these continual wars. The Bible speaks of wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And where do the rumors of wars come from? Where do the actual bloodletting wars come from? The fomenters of war are the Jesuit order, says so right in their oath. To foment war between two peoples that were formerly at peace. To work on both sides of the conflict, <clears throat> even seemingly in opposition to their brother the Jesuit that's operating on the other side, just so that the Holy Roman Catholic Church benefits in the end. They foment the wars, they control the wars, they profit from the wars, and then they establish the peace, only to be sure that there is further conflict down the road. Why is the Vatican so preoccupied with the Israel and the Palestine conflict? Because the end game for the papacy is to rule the world as God on the earth from Jerusalem. That's what it's all about. There's your Antichrist. The Holy See also plays a significant role in pursuing diplomatic solutions to international problems, whether promoting peace between Israel and Palestine, for example, or helping end the civil war in Lebanon, or obtaining the release of nearly 100 political prisoners from Cuba in 2010, or numerous other examples discussed in this book. Why is the power and influence of the Holy See underestimated? Listen to this. Part of the answer lies in the fact that it is an extraordinarily complex and unique institution, and is therefore easier to dismiss than to understand. That's right. The Vatican, the papacy, the curia is misunderstood because nobody cares to take the time. It's too laborious. And besides, nobody likes bad news. That's why it's so misunderstood. It's just well, it gets in the way of a television program to sit and listen to Inquisition Update. Or reading books is, is, you know, for school people. 
you don't have to read books when you graduate from school. Every excuse in the world not to understand who our most grave enemy is. Of course, that attitude will all change when we're forced to observe Sunday as the Sabbath and we're forced to attend Mass. And all of our money will be taken away from us. The entire economy will be digitized and they'll be able to shut off your bank account at the flip of a switch. You either obey the Pope and his civil power, or you won't be able to buy or sell or participate in any form of economic exchange. Then maybe people will be interested in studying this most extraordinarily complex and unique institution and return to their Protestant roots and understand that they should have been protesting all along. He continues, he says, a benevolent quasi-monarchy monarchy, tucked into a corner of a modern democracy, the Holy See is at once a universally recognized sovereign. Universally recognized sovereign representing more than one-seventh of the world's population. You think the Pope doesn't have power and authority? He represents one-seventh of the world's population. And the civil government of the smallest nation-state on Earth. That's right, it's only 108, 109 acres, thereabouts. It has no military. Just one man sitting on a throne dictating to the whole world. And the Christian world is oblivious as to who the Antichrist is. It's, it's, uh, it's an unspeakable atrocity. It says it has no military and only a negligible economy. That is, the Vatican's fungible assets are worth a billion dollars. A mere drop in the bucket compared to, say, Harvard University's $27 billion endowment. But it has greater reach and influence than most nations. Let me tell you something. This author deceitfully represents the Vatican's worth at about a billion dollars. But the Vatican controls the world's gold. You see, the Vatican shrewdly used the Rothschilds to set up uh, Federal Reserve Banks in all the countries of the world. And what the Federal Reserve Banks do is they loan money to war-making nations, get the nations completely in debt so that they can never pay their debt, and then take gold as security on the debt. Now, could anybody calculate the war debt of this country? The national debt of this country rises into the trillions of dollars. That's with a T, trillions of dollars. It's readily apparent to every American with a brain that we are indebted beyond our ability to pay. As a matter of fact, all of our gold is held in reserve by the Federal Reserve Bank, the Jesuit Bank. And now they're taking the land and even claiming the lives of the people as collateral. And this author has the brazen audacity to suggest that the Vatican only has an economy of about a billion dollars. Was any of the listeners listening today around when I read the Vatican Billions by Avril Manhattan. Surely you understand that the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church is incalculable. It has never been audited, nor will it ever be audited, because it would be impossible to audit the Vatican's true wealth. That's how wealthy 
the Vatican is. All right, it has no military and only a negligible economy, according to this author. The Vatican's fungible assets are about are worth about a billion dollars, a mere drop in the bucket compared to, say, Harvard University's $27 billion endowment. But it has greater reach and influence than most nations. Why does it have greater reach and influence? Just follow the money. It has great reach and influence because it owns practically every modern nation. A nation is enslaved by its debtors. And the Vatican holds the debt to the United States. And we are a slave nation to the Vatican. We do Rome's bidding. He continues, he says, the word Catholic, quote-unquote Catholic, originates from the Greek word uh, Catholicos, Excuse me. And it means universal. Okay? This is taught in every Roman Catholic school from catechism all the way through. The words Catholic and universal are interchangeable. Okay? Every Roman Catholic is taught this. It's the universal church, it appeals to every man. It's a world church. Okay, and this is what is behind the ecumenical movement. To embrace all religions. This became most apparent during the pontificate of Pope John Paul II, where he paid deference to every religious leader in the world, and they all acknowledged him as the spiritual leader of the world, the leader of all religions. This was done in public at the Vatican. And the the ecumenical movement, as it grows, leaves us all who defend the gospel of Jesus Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ, and we serve Jesus Christ in him only. It leaves us to be seen by the world as radical fundamentalists, as, well, haters of other religions. And that's the purpose of the universal church, because we will not negotiate. We will not compare ourselves, neither will we have anything to do with other religions. There's but one God, and we worship him and serve him. And so when we speak out against the Vatican or against the papacy or against other religions, we're called haters, dividers, instead of uniters. The whole world is ready to capitulate to a global religion. And you can worship a god by any name and keep any tradition so long as you participate in the papacy's new world order and give a, a, give deference to the papacy. All right. The universal religion, it got its beginnings in ancient Babylon. You've heard me talk about it before. I won't rehearse that again. But it's a universal religion. It is not an exclusive religion as is the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It is a counterfeit to that kingdom. It's a very popular kingdom in the world, and the whole world wonders after the beast. I see we're coming up on the break. You've been listening to the first half hour of Inquisition Update. We'll return right after these messages and continue on the book, The Global Vatican, by former U.S. Ambassador Francis Rooney. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update. We'll continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Global Vatican. And uh, I want to stop here and, and correct something, or at least make an addition to something I said earlier. It's stated in the text here that the Vatican has no military. That is an untruth that this author knows is untrue. The military 
<clears throat> of the Roman Catholic Church is legion. Okay? It's headed up by the Jesuits. The Jesuits are the special forces for the Roman Catholic Church. And almost equivalent to them are the Knights of Malta. They're all knights, okay, warriors for the Pope. They swear oaths to defend the Pope and to extend his power and authority all over the world. That's their job. But if that's not convincing to you, what should become apparent eventually, if not already, is that the papacy throughout all of its history has commanded the militaries of the world. And the, the, the easiest to recognize example of that is through the Crusades. Now, many think the days of the Crusades are over, where the Roman Catholic Church can command armies to go and conquer lands for the Pope. But I maintain that the three world wars, the First World War, the Second World War, and the current war on terror, the global war on terror, is likewise a crusade for the benefit of the papacy to extend his power and authority in the world. And the most reliable, the most prolific, the most effective military force, military force in the, in the, in the form of battle fighting, is the United States military. It's your blood, and if you be Protestant, it is your Protestant blood, your Protestant guts, and your Protestant taxpayers' money that finances and perpetuates these perpetual crusades in foreign lands to extend the authority of the papacy. That's the truth. Our debt is owed to the Federal Reserve Bank, a Jesuit bank. This country is, is a debt slave to the Vatican. And we pay part of our debt to the Vatican through our suffering in war through the financial strain to finance these wars. A third of your life has been spent working to pay the IRS, the tax collector for the Federal Reserve Bank. Without firing a shot, without enlisting, without being recruited into the Army, you have worked one-third of your life to pay the taxes to finance these crusades. You are no less a slave than an armor-carrying soldier on the battlefield. And Rome needs us all. And until or unless we protest, those papal crusades will continue. And so will the flow of our blood and our guts and our tax dollars. He says the word Catholic originates from the Greek word Catholicos, meaning universal. It's a universal church, the universal church. The church has been earning that description since the days of the Roman Empire, when Christianity spread like wildfire through Europe, North Africa, and the Arab Peninsula. Today, the Roman Catholic Church remains a singular, supranational force operating effectively in more places and cultures than any other international body, with the possible exception of the United Nations. The possible exception of the United Nations. Who do you suppose controls the United Nations? I know, I know, Tom. The Pope controls the United Nations, too. He really does. And that will be plainly evident to those who are paying attention when the Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible, the current one, Francis I, comes and addresses a joint session of Congress in September and then makes his pilgrimage over to the United Nations to give instruction to his crusaders. He says, actually, I would argue that the Holy See has the longer and deeper reach. Unlike the United Nations, which often imposes itself on local cultures from the outside, 
The Catholic Church is part of any place it is present, whether a Nigerian village or an Ecuadorian farming community or a middle-class American suburb. See, they've got us from within and from without. The papacy rules wherever it goes. Roman Catholicism is a global religion. They have a branch office in nearly every neighborhood, particularly in this country, but also in most countries around the world. It's called the Roman Catholic Church. And, of course, the churches <clears throat> and the bishops that rule them are the ones who make sure that the public officials elected to governmental offices are Roman Catholic. And then if a nation in the world somewhere tends to reject Roman control, then they can always rely upon the United Nations and even NATO to uh, overthrow those regimes and put in a government that's friendly to the papacy and cooperative with the New World Order. From within and from without. Now, it's not simply a number or, or variety of people that the Holy See represents that gives it relevance. It's also the moral influence of the church, still considerable despite secularization and scandals. Let me name some of the scandals. The global pedophile priest scandal. And seemingly unending bank scans, uh, Vatican bank scandals. The assassination of popes. Okay? That's right. The Jesuits control the Roman Catholic Church, and if a pope happens to become a heretic or does something that the Jesuits advise not to do in this quest to conquer and control the whole world, they simply dust the Pope and put in another one. That's just scratching the surface of the scandals of the Roman Catholic Church. I've already mentioned this, the uh, inquisitions that claim the lives of Bible-believing Protestants and those who were Protestant long before the Protestant Reformation to the tune of hundreds of millions of people. The scandals, it is the church of scandal. It's a scandal that it's even called Christianity. That in itself is a scandal. It's a scandal against the throne of Almighty God. To call the throne of Antichrist the representative of, of Christ, to call it Christian, is the unspeakable scandal. He continues, he says, The Holy See advocates powerfully for morality in the lives of both Catholics and non-Catholics. Are you a non-Catholic? He advocates for morality in your life. How does the Pope do that? By passing laws through the civil government that control your morality so that you cannot serve God, but you must serve the Pope by obeying his laws, which are contrary to God's holy law. Okay, the Holy See advocates powerfully for morality in the lives of both Catholics and non-Catholics and in both individuals and nations. Okay, that's through the civil law. Both laws affecting individuals and entire nations. So, that means that the Pope has his imprint upon international law as well as the civil law. He says, one may disagree with some of the church's positions and yet still recognize the value, the real and practical value of its insistence that quote-unquote right should precede quote-unquote might in world affairs. The Church of Antichrist 
attributes to itself the practical value of right over might. Is that what history reflects? My Bible says it is the church of error. And while the Roman Catholic Church pretends on the surface in public to be a harbinger of peace, underneath it foments all the wars. Now with that real understanding under your belt, listen to what he says again. The Holy See advocates powerfully for morality in the lives of both Catholics and non-Catholics and in both individuals and nations. One may disagree with some of the church's positions and yet still recognize the value, the real and practical value of its insistence that right should precede might in world affairs. Coercion has always been the most reliable tool of the papacy, from the Crusades to the Inquisitions to the world wars that rage even as we speak. He says the historian Arnold Toynbee has made the argument that it is religion, specifically Christianity, that is Roman Catholicism, and its organized framework for defining and advancing moral principles which distinguishes Western civilization from prior ones driving it forward and preventing its degeneration into amorality, that is, the lack of morals. So he's saying that, the United, that, that, that morality in the world is dependent upon this church of Antichrist. The universal Catholic Church continues to provide such a framework, a framework of morality, right? The world, I would argue, is better off for it, says former ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. Then, if the world is far better off for it, why is Christ coming to destroy it? In one hour, smoke and ash... God has already proclaimed her judgment. And Francis Rooney argues that the Roman Catholic Church is vital to maintain world morality. Of course, the Church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, has been disparaged at times throughout its long history, and sometimes for good reason. Critics can point to instances in which its power has been misapplied from the Crusades through the Inquisition right up until the current abuse scandals. So let me be more specific than Mr. Rooney. The pedophile priest pandemic. The global pedophile priest pandemic. It's more accurate than just simply saying the current abuse scandals. It is important to contextualize historical actions, says Rooney, rather than apply contemporary standards to, for example, the 12th century. We must align actions in a given period with the social and political mores of that time and thereby create a balanced perspective. Yes, that's right. When you talk about the Crusades and the Inquisitions, you have to be a little bit well, you have to take into consideration the times. You know what time it was during the Crusades and the Inquisition when the papacy virtually had no opposition? They put down all their enemies. And in the process, virtually wiped out all the fighting age men in Europe. Left the, left the whole continent destitute, fighting its crusades. And that was the context of the time. What's the difference between then and now? Mr. Rooney, what's the difference between then and now? I live a pauper's life because I've spent a third of my life paying for your crusades that continue even today. 
Are you too ignorant and blind to see this, Ambassador Rooney? Well, I forgot. You're Roman Catholic, aren't you? You're not a Protestant. <clears throat> when our discussions broach the subject of crusades and inquisitions, the bloody history, the bloody past of the Roman Catholic Church, Rooney says it's important to contextualize historical actions rather than apply contemporary standards to, for example, the 12th century. We must align actions in a given period with the social and political mores of that time and thereby create a balanced perspective. What was the social and political mores of those times? The same as the social and political mores of our time. The old world order is being restored in the new world order. Only the names and the faces have changed. It's the same old story, just a new millennium. That's the truth. There's your balance, Ambassador Rooney. It's perfectly balanced. The new world order weighs exactly the same as the old world order because they're one and the same. There's your balance. You're conquering the world for the papacy and using the United States to do it, and you represented this antichrist federal government of the United States to the Holy See upon which it serves. You need to know the truth, Mr. Rooney. You were awe-stricken by the antiquity of that organization. You were awe-stricken by its palaces and by its art and by its gold and by its pomp and circumstances and robed priests. And you failed to see the historical, the biblical, and the prophetic truth. He says, nonetheless, it's clearly the case that the church, being a human enterprise, not a divine one, a human enterprise, has occasionally fallen short of its best ideals. Then what could we expect from a human organization but to fall short of divine ideals? But these lapses, says Rooney, do not overshadow the good it has accomplished in the past and more to the point of this book can accomplish in the future. That's right. Rooney and the Roman Catholic Church are looking to the future for their glory. It's called the New World Order, and God is coming to destroy it. Christ himself is coming to destroy it, for only he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. That's what it says in the Bible. Rooney says, on the whole, the church is a powerful and unique source of soft power. To borrow a phrase coined by the political scientist Joseph Nye, soft power is non-coercive. It moves people to do the right thing by appealing to ideals and shared values rather than to fear brute force. I've already covered a 2,000-year history of the Roman Catholic Church using brute force, but I will give deference to their soft power. They do use soft power as well. The carrot and the stick, that is Rome the carrot and the stick. Non-coercive on one hand and the ultimate coercive power in the other. And its ideals and shared values are not biblical. Okay? They're not biblical. Its ideals, the ideals of the Roman Catholic Church are truly human, not divine. He says soft power is sometimes dismissed by hardcore realists as a distraction. But who wants to think and act as if hard power is the only power, the only answer, 
in a nuclear 21st century. When the master of real politic diplomacy, Dr. Henry Kissinger, and wouldn't you just know it, a U.S. ambassador to the Holy See would, would mention Henry Kissinger, a knight of Malta, a fellow Roman Catholic, a, federal, a, a fellow globalist, one of the most powerful and influential globalist papists in the country, who is a personal advisor to Pope Benedict XVI and Pope John Paul II, and probably the current pope. When the master of real politic diplomacy, Dr. Henry Kissinger, notes in his recent book, On China, that a, quote, congruence on values is generally needed to supply an element of restraint, unquote, in international relations, He's giving a nod of respect to soft power. That is, Roman Catholic soft power. Okay? But what did, what did Henry Kissinger talk about? A congruence on values. Now, most people would recognize that our values are determined by our religious faith. And so there needs to be congruence in religious faith. Congruence on values. And that will provide an element of restraint in international relations. You know what all that gobbledygook is suggesting? We need to get all the religions together. Okay? To stop the threat of global nuclear annihilation. That's right. Henry Kissinger, a knight of Malta, one of the most powerful servants of the papacy in our time, is openly, although with terms that aren't recognizable to the average American, is openly suggesting a global religion and suggesting that if we don't unite all the global religions and bring about a congruence on values, then we are we remain at, in a uh, threatened by nuclear annihilation. Okay, the carrot and the stick. The carrot is uniting all the religions. The stick is nuclear annihilation. And who is more qualified to offer those ultimatums than Dr. Henry Kissinger? Henry Kissinger gives the nod to soft power, but he also wouldn't hesitate to use the stick. And neither would his serve neither would his master in Rome. If this new world order begins to topple, if Protestantism begins to rear its head again and really threaten the papacy, if the Pope is once again recognized the world the, the Christian world over as the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible, then Rome will have to use the stick. but I don't believe God will allow him to do it. This earth is his, and the fullness thereof. And this counterfeit in Rome will never be allowed to destroy Christ's creation. God is going to renovate it. The Bible tells the ending from the beginning. This world will be renovated by fire, and a new heaven and a new earth will be our home. Evil will be done away with, and only righteousness and peace will prevail from that point on. Are you a member of this earthly Christian kingdom called Christian, or are you a member of the heavenly kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness and liberty and peace and plenty? Don't be fooled by the human worldly counterfeit to a very real kingdom headed up by Christ. 
That's all we have for today. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll continue where we left off. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Thanks. <laughs>